It gives me absolute immense, immense pleasure to welcome two very renowned subject matter experts here for today's webinar. We have our speaker here, Dr. Professor K. Rajgopal Shinoi, sir, and our moderator, Dr. H. V. Shivram, sir, for today's webinar. Dr. Shivram Sir is a head of the Department of Surgery and Allied Specialities and Program Director, Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery at Astor CMI Hospital, Bangalore. Sir is the National Executive Committee member of Associations of Surgeons of India. Sir is the Executive Board member of Obesity and Metabolic Surgery Society of India. Sir is also a PG teacher accredited by the National Board of Examinations. Sir has written book chapters and has publications both nationally and internationally in journals. That said, I'd, have, I'd like to hand over this session to Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome you all for this uh, webinar. I'm sure it will be very, very interesting. Professor K. Rajgo Paul Shanai is professor of many, many professors. <laughs> he is from the very well-known Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. And in his vast experience of 34 years, he has trained many postgraduate students, undergraduate students, and many of his faculty are very well known all over the world. He has worked not only in the uh, teaching category, also he had held many administrative posts in his long experience. He is very popular teacher and he is always in demand to give lectures to postgraduates and in faculty in most of the conferences. But what he is very well known is for his books and four of his books are very well received all over the world. And I'm sure all of you know the Manipal Manual of Surgery, which he is very periodically updating with full enriched knowledge. He has more than 64 publications, one or two guest lectures, and 140 clinical discussions at state and national level. He has done many of the orations. And more than that, he's a very nice human being and a great singer. During this lockdown period, I am sure many of you have heard his uh, these songs which are all available in the YouTube also. Uh, thank you Dr. Rajgopal Shanai for accepting to give this talk which is very very important both from the postgraduate point of view and also from the practicing surgeons that is the upper GI bleed. Eminently he has excluded the variceal bleed because that is an important another chapter itself. So let us have his talk on the non-variceal upper GI bleed. Request to all the uh, delegates who are attending, please post your questions and comments. And at the end of the talk, we will take as many as possible and uh, have an interaction with Professor Rajgopal Shani. Uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Zaidus, for this uh, nice uh, platform for us to interact academically. So over to you, Dr. Rajgopal Shani. Thank you. Very good evening to all of you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shivram, for uh, introducing me to this uh, audience. And uh, thank you, Zaidus, for giving this opportunity. And uh, today I'll be sharing my experience with the non-variceal upper GI bleeding. As uh, Dr. Shivaram put it, GI bleeding itself is a very huge uh, topic per se. And uh, to combine both variceal and uh, non-variceal, it becomes so difficult. 
that two are actually separate entity even though basic management may remain the same you may come across some kind of a overlap here but uh, this is what is my contents my of my talk today with one or two case capsules so that which i thought i should uh, share with you so it's important that uh, upper gi tract when you talk it's obviously referred to uh, you know proximal to ligamentous traits it the manifestation of the upper gi bleed can be in the form of hematemesis or just a coffee ground vomitus or melina or icu setup sometimes you don't know suddenly uh, there is a hemoglobin drop it may not manifest as hematemesis just a drop that's also considered as upper gi bleed and uh, all of you know that peptic ulcer disease is the common cause of gi bleed uh, there are some definitions here they may vary but when you say acute means it requires admission and resuscitation when you say about massive it's about uh, say 1000 uh, you know 500 ml or more you know that's a blood loss in uh, 24 hours or 25% of intravascular volume loss a general introduction that uh, it's usually an emergency department you get 1 to 2% of admissions but uh, you know interesting thing as vast majority the bleeding episodes will cease I, they may recur that's a different issue in general 80% are upper gi bleed and rest are of course lower gi and today we also talk about small bowel bleeds and in the 80% of the non variceal and 20% of the upper gi bleeding is due to variceal bleeding it's interesting even in a cirrhosis patient non variceal bleeding still accounts for about 50% now some more things are important here hemorrhage in a older age group is quite common and uh, they are the one where they cannot uh, tolerate the shock properly so they at requires an aggressive resuscitation here so upper gi bleeding affects almost you can see the statistics uh, quite a high statistics so it's an important that uh, one should know about it Uh, the mortality ranges may from 5 to even 15 percent of an average of 11 percent. Every hospital should have a written protocol. Otherwise, you don't know what time a patient will come straight in front of you to the casualty and have a massive bleed. He may aspirate and he may die. So it depends upon the bleeding. You should be able to, you know, there should be some written protocols for resuscitation as well as management. so when we talk about upper gi bleeding per se just exclude that varices you can classify them in whichever way you want esophageal causes or a gastric cause and a duodenal causes hepatobiliary pancreas and even some medical causes and uh, it's important when a patient comes there first we would like to rule out these medical causes it's to know that uh, history of fever including this hemorrhagic uh, dengue fever leptospira bleeding tendencies etc as surgeons we are interested in these very causes out of which we will be talking about few of them in little more details which includes a peptic ulcer disease or acute gastric mucosal lesions they are nothing but actually we call them as erosive gastritis stress gastritis and few other important causes these are the ones which can give rise to sometime massive bleed dulophile lesions these are how you classify them in esophagus also you can also classify iatrogenic for example you do an endoscopy and a sphincterotomy it can give rise to massive bleed so iatrogenic causes also vascular causes ulcer causes malignancy so this is how uh, we can broadly classify them so that's what i said but vast majority 85% goes to these three important things including the drug induced like anesthetics and aspirin plus acute gastric mucosal lesions peptic ulcer and esophageal gastric varices this uh, will give you some idea about the acute gi bleeding in uk um, ulcers and erosions yes they also like ours only but uh, port hypertension varices this side you can see here that's comparatively less it's a uh, compared to our country here and uh, there's one group here that's they have written as no cause found even in uk what it means says that if you really go on investigating them further further you will be able to pick them 
but still there are few percentage where a cause even cannot be identified. So that's the important thing about acute GI bleeding. So when I said cause cannot be identified, you hold, one should know about few important things like few definitions of what is obscure. See, many times you do an upper GI scopy, or for that matter, in the lower GI bleed, you do colonoscopy, and uh, you don't find any 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 finding there. You call them as obscure, but again the bleeding starts. When you do when you do a further evaluation of them, it can be a fecal occult blood positive. That's for lower GI or iron deficiency anemia. Still, you there's no visible bleeding. That is called as obscure occult, and obscure overt means. That's what initial evaluation has failed, but later second attempt of doing a scopy, you will find a actual recurrent bleed. That's called as obscure overt. Whereas obscure occult, you are not able to find any visible bleeding, but you can see here more than 80% may resolve also, but some of them will give rise to iron deficiency, anemia, etc. So these definitions are important. So when you talk about the obscure, what I told you just now, Initial evaluation fails. So these are some of the things may be rare, but one should be aware when you evaluate a patient who has got upper GI tract bleeding. I'll be explaining to you little more details about each one of them later, all these definitions. So let us keep it in mind. Gastrointestinal stomal tumors, dulophile lesions, Cameroon ulcers, gastric antral vascular ectasia, some of the rare syndromes and angiodysplasia. So this is how you classify them. So I mentioned about some of the esophagus, none of them produce any acute bleeds, but the list is big. We do find tuberculosis. See, some of these cases are uh, infective esophagitis, radiation induced, reflux, Barrett's, Crohn's, and even a tumors. Tuberculosis per se may not happen due to swallowing of the bacilli unless there is a tear in the esophagus. It could be a manifestation from the nodes. So these are the few of the important causes in the esophagus. They do produce as a, actually not massive bleeds. Uh, just to break the monotony, I have given a puzzle for all of you just to keep it in mind what's the cause of obscure bleeding. I'll be giving the answer for you to at the end of the, my, my talk. Just these are some yellow things are some of the clue. One prime minister smoker with acidity. Aortic stenosis with the renal failure was advised angiogram. He consulted a French surgeon. He told him the gist of the aortic stenosis, told him not to have alcohol and not to smoke and gave him watermelon. Uh, this looks a little bit funny now. But at the end of the talk, I'll give you the answers for this. But answers are hidden in my presentation. So with this initial introduction, what is acute bleed I have mentioned to you? What is massive bleed? And what is occult bleed? So with the GOAT evaluation and physical examination and resuscitation. So that's the important thing. You have to take the history properly here. Don't say that I will do straight away investigations. Yes, it should go run parallelly maybe, but at the same time, alcohol history or a chronic weight loss, maybe a malignancy here, chronic renal disease, I mentioned to you that uh, angiodysplasias are quite common there. Whether the patient has undergone sphincterotomy, pancreatitis, you also ne you need to know the nature. Remember, fresh red blood means a chance of re-bleeding is more. If there's a little bit of dark altered Coffee, coffee colored blood, may, re bleeding may be less. Whether the patient has got a syncope, that means the bleeding is quite significant, maybe a class two hemorrhage. Whether the patient is on drugs, many patients are on anticoagulants for many reasons. And uh, whether he is taking any beta blockers, because what happens is the pulse rate may not be going up in spite of bleeding. So that's how you evaluate an upper GI bleeding in the emergency department. A simple logic in the supine position, BP is less than 90 means, look at that, a blood loss can be as high as 40%. In the hypotension in the upright position, if there's an upright position, 
it can be a low blood pressure so this is a few important things you should know in casualty and these are some of the uh, peripheral signs you look melanin spots means you know the rare syndromes of pure jagas they can have polyps they can be the bleed or these are some of the vascular ectasias lesions these are rare syndromes so that's what you do a quick physical examination yes a pallor just introduce a rails tube we'll come to that later it shows the bleed in fact it's very specific if it is a blood the diagnosis of upper gi bleed purpuric patches pure jagger syndrome a dead white pallor here you can see here so that's how you examine the patient who is uh, who is in an emergency department even though this is not uh, today's topic but when a patient comes to you a quick that's what you call as head to toe examination of uh, including parotids including gynecomastia means obviously is having a chronic liver disease or he may be in a liver cell failure itself flaps or encephalopathy so drowsiness all these things have to be quickly assessed in casualty as i mentioned to you upper gi bleeding is something which is serious sometimes you can have a massive bleed so resuscitation history taking and maybe investigation should go parallelly so start with the two large bore cannulae there 16 to 18 gauge and first important thing is to treat the shock here this what specially happens when a patient who has got maybe a peptic ulcer bleed which is completely a treatable disease you can start with the noradrenaline 0.05 micrograms per kg body weight per minute and whenever there's a massive bleed yes you do put an esophagic tube if there's a mild bleeding or if you are evaluating for anemia it may not be required because what happens is otherwise there's a chance that uh, you know the you may uh, increase the incidence of aspirations put a catheter a simple foot and elevation leg elevation may help you and uh, that's how you treat them i mentioned to you already resuscitation and investigation should occur simultaneously if there's a major bleed yes you may have to give a o negative blood remember always to take a ready with the you know the massive transfusion protocols and uh, platelets fresh frozen plasma etc do you intubate definitely yes if there's a patient who has got hypertension drowsy because he himself might get drowned in his massive bleeding so hypertension shock drowsiness encephalopathy definitely such patients require an intubation it's an important for uh, at least for the sake of uh, uh, knowledge and, and a few of them in case for some reason you don't get iv lines at all this is mentioned as intra osseous excess intra osseous means inside the bones actually if you look at this uh, way back in 1922 itself a uh, drinker is the man who said that uh, non collapsible vein you know non collapsible vein in a mammalian bone so that's important so what they mention is a any thin cortical bone having a medullary cavity a flat surface and it should be easy classical example is the tibia or even proximal uh, you know that uh, humerus so that can be used to resuscitate these patients and uh, you can give up to you know that it's a i was intra osseous even 150 ml per minute uh, you can give a uh, transfusions so or a pressure bag can be inflated uh, you know you can up to 300 mm of mercury so that also will help you helpful in a transfusion of a fluids through the intra osseous route what about nasogastric aspirate i mentioned to you it's got a sensitivity may be less but you know specificity is high and uh, it's a positive predictive value is quite high so when you have a doubt you can introduce a nasogastric tube in the initial plan and uh, it will definitely detect later you may remove it but keep it in mind some of the complications for a if you keep it for a long period right so investigations as you send the blood not only for hemoglobin full liver function test because this is an area where a consumption coagulopathy can happen with the massive bleed with the thrombocytopenia keep ready platelets platelet counts and of course liver disease patient has got a hepatic uh, you know involvement cirrhosis coagulopathy to be keep it in mind so fibrinogen so lfts this have to be done what about the blood products yes definitely yes 
especially in a patient who has got a cog you need to prevent the coagulopathy so you need additional platelets fresh frozen plasma should be administered in addition to packed cells now the question is uh, when do you give the blood or whatever uh, transfusion there's something called as a holding off not necessary to overload so hemoglobin is say uh, roughly around eight uh, you need not give so just keep it in mind get ready the blood and get ready for transfusion that's called as holding off and of course the inr has to be checked so these are few important things you took along with the inner patients now any other specific now investigation you need to do all these are special investigation because not necessary uh, rarely a gastrinoma can have a bleed hyperparathyroidism there's so much hypercalcemia so calcium to be checked so when also look at the serum urea nitrogen and creatinine ratio of more than 30 especially increases the likelihood of upper gi bleed especially in a renal failure so once the blood, uh, blood tests are done, now you start with the endoscopy and uh, it's not that you should do it immediately, say four hours, six hours. Preferable is always stabilization of the patient and do it within 24 hours. Unstable patients should never be subjected unless you have a resuscitation. And uh, for some reason, you know that your patient has got a pre-existing disease, whatever, maybe an example of a varices I'm talking, he already previously diagnosed and is unstable, he may be bleeding. You can take them for a scopy within a few hours. But as I mentioned to you, last vast majority is 24 hours. It's not only gives you a diagnosis, it can be therapeutic, but there are some disadvantages. So check this. Do you have this list of oxygen delivery during uh, when you are doing endoscopy? He is massively bleeding, he may aspirate whether the patient is intubated whether you can correct the INR, that's important thing here. Before you have done a performed endoscopy, uh, erythromycin, all of you know that uh, you can give 250 mg. It uh, is supposed to stimulate this uh, motilin uh, so receptors so that uh, emptying is better, so that uh, yeah, repeat endoscopy chances become less. Um, there's not much of a role for a tranexamic acid in, a, in this. That's why I put a question mark here right so now what does the endoscopy tell you you can see those giant ulcers now big ulcers two or three centimeter you know uh, chances of uh, rebreed is high they may not respond to your conservative line of management these are some of the high gastric ulcers along the lesser curvature these are a few images now endoscopy as i mentioned to you resuscitation and diagnosis done and then immediately treatment yes you need to have a definitely all these things Today it's done by the gastroenterology people that uh, they have various types of uh, gadgets here. Basically, these are thermals. They can, uh, you know, they can have a contact uh, that's called as electrocoagulation. But non-contact is also you have got argon plasma coagulation. Especially these are helpful in a angiodysplastic lesion, especially in the colon. Now, the other option is also available is injection adrenaline. Yes, dilution of uh, maybe one in 10,000. Maybe 30 ml may be required in and around the bleeder. You have got a, this with the thermal, the results are quite good. Sometimes you may find a big bleeder, you know, jetting it out. You may have to take a clip. These are called heme clips. And uh, acute erosive gastritis, you know, diffuse variety, a lot of ooze there. It can also happen in gastric antral vas uh, vascular ectasias, portal hypertensive gastropathy. You have then some hemostatic agents, including hemospray. So these are the few things which will help for endoscopic method of control of hemorrhage. So today, most of the bleeders can be managed without surgery by endoscopic method, provided you have all the facility. Now, at this juncture, it's important that at the time of admission, you can get a Rockall scoring here. And uh, there's one more score. You know, these are the few two important scores you should know. That's called Blackford score. Which These are the two things which depend upon. You can see here some of the very good articles. It is from the Lancet here about the Blackford score. A risk score for predict the need for a treatment for an upper GI hemorrhage. It depends upon hemoglobin, 
systolic blood pressure, pulse rate, and a melina, syncope, etc. Whereas a Rockall score usually talks about the age of the patient, comorbidities, uh, you know, cardiac or hepatic. So whether the patient has got systolic blood pressure less than 100, transfusion requirement, and endoscopic findings, whether what type of a lesion he has got. So this is how you put a scoring system. It will help you and roughly what is score zero means, this is what is criteria. Means if you have got a good hemoglobin of more than 12.9 or even a systolic pressure, this is around 110. Pulse rate is less than 100. Blood urea nitrogen less than 18.2 milligram per deciliter. These are the some of the patients, they do not have a risk of a rebleed. So they can be managed very easily. You know, that is what is ultimately you that's the scoring so that's what is the glasgow blood for bleeding score when you say score zero that means this is what it, these are the things which patient has got oh that means that there were re-bleeding is less and uh, there were no deaths or rarely any intervention needed so this is important that you can manage them in the outpatient setting so upper GI scope is definitely a gold standard, no doubt. Now imaging, including ultrasound to know the liver status, definitely. But if you've got any mass lesions, it can be a tumors. CT is better also for a pancreatic lesions. Maybe a pseudoaneurysm breed, or even maybe a, you know, that hemobilia. So we'll come to that later. Iotoentric fistula, a lot of iotic aneurysm surgeries, some low-grade infection, and it may erode into the iota. So that's, it can also give rise to massive bleed. And uh, that's where the CT comes to help. You can see a sensitivity almost up to 86% and specificity is 95%. But uh, when you do a CT scan or CT angio, you should know there should be active bleed of 0.5 ml per minute. Compared to the CT, actually the nuclear scans are uh, better because to say 0.1 ml per minute. But the problem of nuclear scans are, you know, you cannot pinpoint the breeding spot. Especially in the upper GI, there is a hardly any, not much of a role there. I'll put it that way. CT angio is better. No doubt one need to take care of this because uh, care of kidneys. Especially when the patient has got a renal failure, one has to take care of that. It's widely available compared to catheter angiography. Catheter angiography, one advantage being that you can embolize. So if you have a good setup of a radiological embolization unit, case catheter angiograph especially useful in a, in a pseudoaneurysms as well as angiodysplasias, etc. So, so these are a few things you should know about CT angiograph. So I have given you some investigation criteria and uh, diagnosis. With this, we'll go on to a few of the important uh, conditions like peptic ulcer disease. You know that it's the most common problem. Today, definitely the breeders may be less because of effective treatment, H. pylori treatment, and uh, endoscopy. So not many are coming to surgeons, definitely. But NSAIDs have increased now. You can see that greater risk. And patients who are taking NSAIDs have a greater risk of bleeding than patients with H. pylori infection. I hope you have noted this point very clearly. So. Ulcer normally erodes or penetrates into gastrointestinal artery or branches of left gastric artery. Now, when you are doing an endoscopy in a upper GI bleed, peptic ulcer bleed, we need to classify them into forest classification. So usually the, the, this color ones, active pulsatile, 1B is non-pulsatile. This is non-bleeding but visible vessel. So normally 1AB and 2A, it definitely requires some kind of a treatment. These are the ones which probably you can send them and call them for further, you know, follow up of the patient. So that's how you can uh, note down during the endoscopy. This is exactly what a uh, indirect way of putting it. When an ulcer larger than two centimeter, you look at that high bleeding rate. You have visible vessel. Again, rebleeding is forty to sixty percent. Clean ulcer rarely bleeds so if you look at that way if you put the forest classification it comes under forest three that's what i meant 
forest three and two chances of breed are less one yes one a two a our chances of rebreeds are high so that's some of the important uh, systematic review here data so what are the predictors for a rebreed so hemodynamic instability see there's a list is big here but i concentrate on large centimeter two centimeter ulcer or a posterior duodenum lesser curvature of the stomach these are the ones which you know tendency to breed are more so what do you do then upper gi scope is important unstable will go to icu and stable will go to acute ward right so now once you do that try endotherapy i mentioned to you about the first f1 2a 2b so actively bleeders visible vessel i gave you already idea about electrocoagulation and sclerotherapy and uh, with that combination you can achieve 90% of the success in the endoscopic therapy in a peptic ulcer breeds this is a case of a breed with a big vessel there you can see a spurter and a heme clip has been applied and the spurter has stopped so now what about the protein pump inhibitors no doubt they are once you have done endotherapy you need to definitely give because there is a chance of recurrence of the breed here and uh, but uh, their effect on the mortality is not very clear but definitely they will reduce the rebreed so so that's the mainstay of the treatment of peptic ulcer disease you do give them for a period of 4 weeks now what is that you give in the immediate post operative or uh, not post operative after endotherapy is the 80 mg of the bolus of pantoprazole with 8 mg hour for infusion there are some studies giving 40 mg bd also well tolerated and it has got minimal side effects so you do the endotherapy bleeding would have stopped but then you can give iv protein pump inhibitors for 2 3 days and followed by oral and then probably discharge the patient in the low risk forest 3 category etc as and when you are managing the ward you need to know that he has to take stop nsaids no role for antacids here definitely a nasogastric tube and high volume saline wash is uh, necessary so that endoscopy becomes easy there and you are done endoscopy classify them i have already told you and this is how you have controlled the bleeds and uh, always remember the last line there h pylori eradication this is definitely indicated as in a case we have got a recurrent bleeds when do you do surgery as i mentioned to you surgery has become uh, much less today but uh, a patient who has received more than 6 units remember the first initial slide i mentioned about massive transfusion right patient has got shock and uh, elderly patient having shock don't think that they are poor risk in fact they are poor risk not to do surgery that means they have to undergo surgery because elderly patient do not do not tolerate the shock well that is your clinical judgment so when a massive trans uh, massive bleeding occurs in an elderly it's a peptic ulcer disease your diagnosis is better take them for surgery immediately if there's young patient you can definitely wait look at that i mentioned to you about the ulcer size so this is how you size is 2 cm elderly massive bleed clinical judgment and he is the one who requires surgery so in general it's only about 5 to 10% of the patients who require surgery we all know that uh, if a patient who rebleeds after a endotherapy it also can happen so they are also candidates for surgery yes definitely uh, there is a morbidity and a mortality now what is your aim at surgery its goal is to stop the bleeding not to do the you know the cause of the ulcer there's no point in doing a uh you know vagotomy and etc etc so but important is to control the bleed that is what is important so do a minimal thing and get out especially in a massive bleeding patients now we'll come to bleeding gastric ulcer you look at that greater curvature you know you can try a wedge excision then it doesn't cause a much deformity right is excision biopsy is important here because there can be a malignant ulcer so if you have a greater curvature ulcer it's better that you excise 
you will not cause any damage but and so there is chance of a if you do a simple suture ligation or wedge excision high chance of a recurrence is there now what about distal ulcer is better do a distal gastrectomy if you try to do a wedge excision here you know it doesn't work out because what happens is uh, you know it forms a deformation of the stomach deformation and it may give rise to a luminal obstruction or even a gastric valvulus if you try to make it a j shaped stomach so if there is a distal gastric ulcer the answer is a distal gastrectomy not a wedge excision these are some of the reasons why wedge excision should not be done for a distal gastric ulcer now you can do a wedge excision for a proximal gastrectomy because these are very high ulcers doing a proximal gastrectomy carries a very high morbidity and mortality because of anastomosis what you are going to do is esophago jejunostomy so you can do an anterior gastrotomy take a biopsy and you can oversew the ulcer inside the lumen or if you are doing ulcer excision something like a tongue shaped excision you can do and do anastomosis so that's for the proximal gastric ulcer so proximal gastric ulcer don't do proximal gastrectomy Dis distal gastric ulcer yes distal gastrectomy and for a bleeding gastric ulcer on greater curvature you can do a wedge excision of the ulcer and suturing now bleeding duodenal ulcer all of you know that it's a gastro duodenal artery which bleeds classically is called a figure of eight but you can also try this what has been called as an additional stitch of what's called a u stitch a third suture it's underneath the ulcer because to control transverse pancreatic branches that enter gastro duodenal artery posteriorly so figure of eight followed by a u shaped stitch underneath the vessel that is what helps and uh, by closing this vertically you will not add any additional mod morbidity or mortality so you say convert it into a pyloroplasty and don't try to attempt a vagotomy this is what is usual recommendation most of these ulcers can be acute ulcers today with the surgical eradication it stops so additional vagotomy is not required you can see some of the ulcers big ulcers there bleeding duodenal ulcer so one look will tell deformity here large ulcer it may not respond to conservative treatment now what about the acute gastric mucosal lesions they are nothing but various nomenclatures there are some subtle differences but whatever it is hypoperfusion it also happens in, in icu setups there is hypotension causing a mucosal ischemia or a damage to the gastric mucosal barrier ultimately resulting in a altered mucus bicarbonate secretions and uh, there is also nsaid induced damage to the endogenous prostaglandins inhibition of the platelet aggregations they all results in enhanced hydrogen ion permeability for regurgitation of bile and pancreatic juices ultimately resulting in multiple acute gastric mucosal lesions it's actually a misnomer they rarely extend through the muscularis mucosa they are very shallow you also heard of the word cushing ulcers they are usually typically happens in a head in neurosurgical causes and curlings happens in the burns you know they can even go up to the duodenum i mentioned to you in icu setup sepsis these are all various causes so i have given in the initial part when there is a sudden drop in the blood pressure in your patient in icu think of a acute gastric mucosal lesions or induced ulcers so you need to do an endoscopy confirm that diffuse here you can see the multiple you know oozing there and uh, see this multiple erosions mucosal parer so all this can give rise to acute mucosal lesions these are little larger ones so i already mentioned the treatment for that what to do but in a icu setup it's not just that you can do a heme spray or etc but you control these four either a patient is having a sepsis for which has been operated or without sepsis also without operation also 
good saturation coagulopathy blood transfusion that itself will control in more than 80% of the cases and only when it doesn't stop you can try the other methods including endotherapy or even a vasopressin if still doesn't stop if it's solitary bleeding site see you are done initially the pictures which i showed you they are multiple if they're solitary these are all the things you can do this is of course the field of a medical gastroenterologist and uh, this will rarely come today for a surgeon so i have not probably come across this situation for the last 20 years so what's the idea of the prophylaxis all those patients who are in the icu you need to give them actually good proton pump inhibitors which will act as a prophylaxis to control the gi bleed so who should be given all those patients who are in icu with the res respiratory management when should be given starting from the day itself critical illness maybe by the third day sucralfate you can try initially because it neutralizes the acid and uh, you can continue later with the proton pump inhibitors so this is what is the prophylaxis which you give so acute gast gastric mucosal lesions are largely managed with the conservative line of treatment with the endotherapy proton pump inhibitors now we have finished two now third one is a malaria wish syndrome and which you know that it's a longitudinal tear you know say usually happens after the second vomitus very forcible vomitus here but uh, interestingly uh, most of them will stop spontaneously but 10 percent can go for a severe hypotension and shock there are various causes so look at that so even a pregnancy alcohol pancreatitis uremia epilepsy all these can give rise to a tear basically a sudden uh, you know contraction of the diaphragm there and with the tear in the esophagus producing a malaria waste syndrome normally it goes up to the stomach there right and uh, there is a forcible contraction i already mentioned to you so lesser curvature is affected and you can length almost 15 to 20 centimeter length that's one of the cases and uh, conservative line of treatment stops in majority so with the nasogastric tube in place transfusion saline wash endotherapy you can try and uh, very very rare to these patients to undergo a surgery in the form of gastrotomy and control the bleed what are dulafoy vascular uh, malformations uh, dulafoy is the french surgeon along the again the gas uh, lesser curvature there is some of the unusual large artery you know they runs and close contact with the mucous membrane and uh, for some reason some erosion has happened and this will start bleeding and why lesser curvature why uh, within 6 cm this is the reason submucosal arteries here do not arise from submucal plexus but directly from the arterial chain this is one of the important cause of occult bleed i mentioned to you in the initial class initial initial uh, slide right so that's one of the cause for occult obscure gi bleed remember it can be life threatening and earlier people have done a blind gastrectomy for this today you need to have patients here initial endoscopy can be normal you may have to do it repeat that's why it's called obscure and uh, it's a very tortuous lesion there that's histologically i mentioned you it's an abnormally large diameter vessel so it's more common in men no doubt these these are some of the ways you rule out because you you it may be a ulcer so it, but typical site is six centimeter i mentioned to you various endoscopy finding you want need to know so that you will know that it's a bleed which may bleed again so you need to do endotherapy is the first choice if it stop if you know it's a vascular malformation then of course this is a place for embolization and this also will fail the various particles you can use it for embolization micro particles or mechanical agents or even a coils liquid agents like ethylene alcohol etc rarely i mentioned to you that you need to do the surgery in this patients and uh, 
I'm sorry, just surgery is. Yes. Uh, there is a controversy whether you do this. Uh, our earlier cases where endotherapy has failed here, you can see. He had a rebleed and we opened, and that was a finding that was excised and it is reported dual of five. So simple underrunning is one choice, but doesn't give histology. And uh, this is a wide excision, and uh, rarely they used to do a gastrectomy also, but today it is not considered. Now, I'll just give an interesting case of a clinical case capsule here. And this is the picture of my postgraduate who has put, who is now expert uh, GI surgeon. So 30 year old male, and uh, he presented with this mask there, and uh, it was somewhere here, you can see here. And he said it could be a portal hypertension with the palpable spleen. And he has presented with the hematemesis. And uh, naturally, that should be the common diagnosis, uh, which uh, everybody thinks. But you know, it was looking like spleen, but uh, there was uh, no notch. But actually, carefully, if you see, this is not in the splenic region, it's much medial. And later we find it is the gist gastrointestinal stromal tumors. Now we'll come to the tumors of the stomach. When you talk about the tumors of the stomach for a GI bleed, you need to think of first is the gastrointestinal stromal tumors. Very often they attain a large size because uh, they do not bleed till there is a mucosal ulceration. And that, if you do an endoscopy, gives something like a cervix appearance. You can see the mucosal ulceration. That is the tumor earlier called a leomyoma, that is the CT finding, and uh, that is the, our case of a large uh, stromal tumors. So whenever you have got a patient who has got upper abdominal, large mass, GI bleed, not much of a weight loss, loss of appetite, always think of a stromal tumors, and that's the case. There's a large tumor there, you can see, right? So that is the case of a gastrointestinal stromal tumors, popularly called as a GIST. This is only for completion sake, I have put carcinoma of the stomach because uh, it's easy for a diagnosis. Any upper GI bleed, actually they do not produce a massive bleed, but anemia, asthenia, anorexia, and all that thing. So you do an endoscopy and treat the carcinoma of the stomach. But one of the important things to realize that anemia in carcinoma of the stomach may not be related directly to the bleeding. It could be related to the uh, defective absorption of the iron because of the achlorhydria, thus a conversion of the ferrous to ferric is affected. So the reason why there is anemia in costume of the stomach. Any polyps for that matter, if this is the source of the bleed, that can be actually endo loops can be applied. So that's a case of endo loop and this is how they treat the polyps. So in the stomach, we have talked about the important things is the dulophile lesions, peptic ulcer, gastric mucosal lesions and uh, lastly i mentioned about the polyps and carcinoma of the stomach now pseudo aneurysms um, these are the ones which are not common cause but uh, you know that uh, they can occur both in acute as well as chronic pancreatitis pancreatitis being one of the common problems in india so this could be aneurysmal degeneration of these vessels it is usually a splenic artery or even a gastroduodenal for that matter, or a pancreatic duodenal. A large pseudocyst can erode into these vessels, giving rise to pseudoaneurysms and with the bleed. So that's what is called as, in fact, when this uh, blood from a pseudocyst rupture into the pancreatic duct, especially with the bleed, it's called as hemosuccus pancreatitis. No doubt, you need to do an ultrasound CT angiogram, very dangerous condition. Early diagnosis is important here. So upper GI bleed with abdominal pain. Patient is a known patient of pancreatitis. Uh, if you ask it, you may get a brewery. This is how you think. Uh, there's a possibility uh, from that it can rupture into the duct. And even it can rupture into the, you know, the abdominal cavity, peritoneal cavity. So that's what has been even mentioned as a double rupture. A pseudoaneurysm rupture into the lesser sac and when it is full there into the peritoneal cavity. What has been mentioned as a double rupture phenomenon. So you can see a gastroduodenal aneurysm there. 
and this is a time when we do not have the embolization facilities and uh, that's what is the treatment this was excised and uh, along with the pancreas of course subtotal pancreatectomy so that's what i have mentioned to you but today best line of treatment is arterial embolization so gel foam with the coils i have been found to be superior and uh, you no doubt the initial resuscitation is common for all patients if there's any coagulopathy that has to be corrected it has to be given in the form of fresh, fresh frozen plasma platelet etc and then only stable patient only should undergo angiogram selective angiogram and a visceral embolization lastly when they fail only question of surgery comes today mortality for surgery is very very high so if your expertise fail a lot of, it's a problematic situation uh, intracystic ligation pogarthi control of the vessel so many things have been described for treatment of pseudo aneurysm bleeds now we'll go to some of the rare causes of a non variceal gi bleed one of them is aortoentric fistula uh, these are some of the various causes one of them being you can see here aortic aneurysm i mentioned to you in the initial part that you have done a synthetic graft there and uh, for some reason some inflammation and uh, it can rupture that's low grade infection you know it can be anywhere in the body which is present can cause this graft infection and give it may erode into the aorta and cause a bleed of course i have no experience of this so that's what is usually done emergency laparotomy this is beyond the way to discuss here these are the one which causes massive bleed but just a, know that this is a known complication which can happen as an upper gi bleed uh, what are cameroon ulcer i mentioned it, these are rare ulcers they are one causes for a chronic blood loss especially in a large hiatus hernia having an ulceration they are called a cameroon ulcer so it what is the reason that's because they are compressed by the diaphragm uh, so that is what is called as cameroon ulcer again obscure bleeds so endotherapy endoscopy is the treatment what is gave they are nothing but a gastric antral vascular ectasias you know women are commonly affected antrum is affected there's an ectasia there you know red parallel stripes so the reason why they have been called as watermelon uh, stomach this can also see in uh, portal hypertension and they have even done tips for to control the bleed here and uh, this is what is the pathology that's a mucosal uh, you know fibromuscular hyperplasia no doubt you do endoscopy if there's a liver disease you control the liver disease otherwise if there's autoimmune disease steroids have been tried and uh, lastly antrectomy as i mentioned to you it's a rarely done this is one other thing one should know more for a lower gi bleed but it is also known in a upper gi bleed it's called as a head is syndrome this is basically aortic stenosis patients who have been uh, replaced you know that uh, with the valve and uh, and you, they are also usually taking the drugs so they are damaged von willebrand factors which gets normalized after aortic valve replacements so this is the place where they do get you know telangiectasia and uh, there is one study or showing even uh, many studies showing treatment with the estrogen for control the bleed from telangiectasia in a patient with the chronic renal disease and hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia and von willebrand's disease right so there is a role for treatment with the estrogen here but what i am trying to the aortic stenosis with angiodysplasia that has been called as hydis syndrome right so that's what are the common causes for a gastrointestinal angiodysplasia in general it's a wrong belief to think that they are congenital no they are acquired and these are the various causes for a angiodysplasia i have one last clinical case capsule before i end a case of a brent abdominal trauma young boy who had a liver laceration and they don't sutured he had some fractures he took nsaid also they were given and he was presented to the hospital pain fever hematemesis 
So initial laparotomy was done in peripheral hospital and upper geoscopy a surgeon done. Erosions were recorded and uh, what do you treat? Treat it as erosive gastritis, but bleeding continued. So it's a case of basically a blunt abdominal trauma with the liver laceration, sutured, a re-bleed, uh, not re this GI bleeding, endoscopy shows gastritis, Managed conservative rebleed, ultrasound was done. This is the diagnosis. Resolving hematoma or even a common hepatic artery, pseudo aneurysm with the thrombus. So, next day, as is conservative, we had another massive hematomesis and we did a CT scan. And this is the finding of the CT scan that's the hypodense lesions you can see here. So, that is the area. Now, CT scan shows uh, that's an emergency ultrasound showing a hemobilia with the blood in the gallbladder. And uh, that was a pseudoaneurysm hematoma. And uh, that is the final report of a hypodense lesion in the segment four with a intensely enhancing component, suggestion of a thrombus allowing from a branch of the left hepatic artery. So that is what is pseudo aneurysm but with the rupture and why hematemesis is nothing but hemobilia so this is a case of hemobilia and we did an emergency angiogram and embolization of the branch of the left hepatic artery temporary bleeding stopped you can see that unfortunately this patient had another hematemesis it has failed and uh, we need to open this patient and ligate the branch of the left hepatic artery uh, and uh, it stopped. Just for the sake of postgraduates, this is called a sandblom triad of uh, hemobilia, pain, melina, and uh, jaundice. So, this is case illustration to tell you hemobilia being one of the causes for a GI bleed. My dear friends, uh, a puzzle for an obscure bleed, remember I gave you earlier. Prime Minister, I'm referring to earlier Prime Minister of UK, as uh, name, of course, name only, Cameron. They are nothing but ulcers in the hiatus hernia, aortic stenosis, they are nothing but Heidi syndrome, renal failure patients have got angiodysplasias, French surgeon is a dulophy, GIST is nothing but gastrointestinal tumors, of course, alcohol means stress gastritis and gave his gastric antral vascular ectasias. I mentioned to you the various causes. Of course, watermelon, that's also called as watermelon. So this is the causes for an obscure GI bleed. So dear friends, to conclude, upper GI tract bleeding is a common problem. I have confined myself to the non-vericial, but varicis also forms almost 20 to 30%. Peptic ulcer, Acute gastric mucosal lesions or stress, gas, stress ulcers are common. We call them as uncommon, rare, unrecognized, but we need to know because otherwise what happens is we don't evaluate them and the blind procedures, so-called the blind gastrectomies or a blind distal gastrectomy or losing them, chances are high. So a suspicion of a pseudoaneurysm in a pancreatitis patients or a hemobile in a trauma patients are important to be kept in mind. Males have got definitely more risk factors here. And today we need to have endoscopy and CT angiogram. Upper GI bleed, uh, radionuclear scans, I have not found any much useful there because CT angio is the gold standard after endoscopy. Endotherapy, of course, is the first line of uh, uh, diagnosis investigation as well as treatment, proton pump inhibitors, Followed uh, the follows after to about four weeks in case of peptic ulcer disease and stress gastritis. Timely surgery rewarding. With all the thing, I gave you about uh, undetermined or diagnostic problem. These are the ones which are causes occult bleeds. You know they definitely get a diagnose later. You know once you do a re endoscopy in these patients. So these are my various uh, uh, references here. I have got and. Uh, if you have got uh, any um, questions, I'll try to answer them. Uh, if I do not uh, probably know, Dr. Shivaram is also there. 
to to give the answers thank you very much for your patient hearing i thank zaidas for once again for giving this opportunity thank you thank you dr rajgopal shanai that was a wonderful talk very scholarly and uh, you have brought out all the points very well and many names and many syndromes which uh, students are now forgetting you have reminded them and uh, it's nice that uh, many of the your own experience you have brought out and also the case capsules you have given they have made the talk very interesting and uh, definitely uh, you can uh, Uh, dr shena you can stop sharing the uh, this one slides yeah so actually the upper gi bleed is uh, nowadays dealt more by medical gastroenterologist correct and also the interventional uh, radiologist and many of these patients when they reach surgeon or uh, they are in critical conditions and they may be dumped to the surgeons for salvage sake like that we have to be more cautious it's always better to involve the team a team management approach will bring down the stress and also the medical legal problems so please involve the medical gastro and the interventional radiologist and also the icu specialist and anesthetist and if everybody puts together and Uh, do their best definitely the results will be good and also it will be supporting each other in this uh, difficult management of massive upper gi bleeds so to dr rajgopal shane a lot of questions have come across the country so you said sometimes the venous access is difficult and you can or go for the intraocious route so somebody has asked whether sternum should be approached or nowadays you don't see people going for intraocious approach the other approaches like ultrasound guided um, help of getting the vein those are the better options yeah i i i mentioned that uh, one is for the knowledge purpose right. and uh, in a situation where uh, you know sometimes the intra uh, intra venous approach becomes so difficult sometimes not accessible also uh, this uh, intra osseous approach was mentioned and uh, i mentioned uh, tibia as well as humerus but uh, you can also you uh, the sternum to be avoided uh, because sternum is relatively a thin bone thin cortical bone and in fact uh, there are uh, case reports of a you know uh, sternal biopsy a needle has gone into the heart also into the vessels so that is to be avoided yeah. it is it is to be avoided right that is the reason thin cortical bone yeah that is the reason right um in this age of longevity many patients are on uh, blood thinners like aspirin and many people who are having the knee pain and all they are all on uh, nsaids and these bleeds have increased as you said than the, the because of peptic ulcers so what is your take on this they should take any precautions or if they have bleeding problems so what they should do in these situations yeah the, first of all uh, they are elderly patients uh, second thing is uh, they have the knee problems and all that uh, so in addition to the uh, uh blood thinners what you mentioned related to cardiac diseases so ideal is to check their uh, bleeding profile uh, bleeding time clotting time inr etc regularly number one and uh, given a choice they should definitely avoid nsaids especially mm -hmm. these type of patients mm -hmm. probably uh, the, they definitely have to consult consult a uh, consult the physicians or whoever who is treating them and uh, there is a possibility they can be associated with the ulcers also so once in a while they may require an endoscopy also so right. see many times the surgeons face this problem see uh, the endoscopy says there is bleed in the upper in the stomach say they say some point 
but when the surgeon goes and opens up <laughs> they are not able to make out the bleed at all so what do you do in such situations that, that is why i think two things are important one is a surgeon himself should do the endoscopy right uh, in, in our institution or there may be definitely the endoscopy is done by uh, both so they will do the scopy and if they say uh, this is the case required surgery is better that we do the scopy so that you will localize otherwise on table endoscopy is important on table okay so if if you have, if you have opened it and if you are not able to find that means it is a, it is a, to be considered as a, it's a mistake actually it's an it could be an angiodysplasia etc this situation is more happens probably in the lower gi according to me um, may not be in the upper gi this is my personal opinion See, somebody has asked in such situation, is there a role for total gastrectomy? No, no, no. I mentioned to you. I think uh, this was done earlier. That's why I said blind total gastrectomy was done for dualify lesions. I have already mentioned that angiodysplasia, dualify. These are the two situations where people have done total colectomy, total gastrectomy, etc. I don't think there is a role today. Better visualization, very good endoscopy. endotherapy so i think there's no role for totally i think that's an important point nowadays they have the narrow band imaging very magnified uh, so it has also evolved uh, very well so we should uh, i i don't think i have given all the details of what a today's gastroenterology person has got equipments they call it a gold probe and so many things they have got so okay. many varieties okay. so him clips to so they will be able to stop the bleeds so surgeons can sleep peacefully <laughs> <laughs> okay and um, what are the chances of aspiration of blood in massive bleed it is uh, I, i i can't tell you the percentage or something that is why there's a definite chances right. whenever there is a massive bleed uh, i mentioned to you that uh, better to intubate these patients i know they, there is a problem they may not also Uh, some amount of sedation intubation resuscitation so it it is a definite indication right right dr sandeep uh, naik is asking um, if there is fresh bleeding from esophageal varices anyway uh, will nasogastric tube aggravate the bleeding due to trauma i don't think so yeah. according to me i i don't think so because uh, uh, there is already a mucosal uh, ulceration is there so additional nasogastric tube may not uh, may not uh, really you know the damage that further okay dr mohan malliya from raipur is asking what is the role of ct scan and ultrasonography in the workup for upper gi bleeding i already mentioned to you first is always upper gi scopy okay. and if the upper gi scopy picks up let us say a carcinoma stomach or a leiomyoma or i i already given those pictures there and uh, i mentioned about uh, pancreatic pseudo aneurysms and all that things so any space occupying lesion mass lesions nature of the liver so so definitely ct scan role is there but if you pick up a lesion of a peptic ulcer disease or a erosive gastritis or a uh, bleeding dualify etc the ct scan is not required mass lesions and uh, if you are looking at ct angio those yes. are Interven intervention later. Ultrasound may not be very useful in these yes. cases. Yes, Dr. Hitesh Ahmed from Ahmedabad. What is the role of Mallory Weiss tears in the etiology of upper GI bleeding? I think you have already dealt with it. Uh, yeah. The various I mentioned. I think uh, what uh, causes. I think. Correct. Right. So I just mentioned so that people should know because we do get a medical call. You get a ref get a reference from a bleed from a. um a pregnant patient also i have seen one patient right so 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 that is why those various causes are there whichever uh, i'll call to so i mentioned that true yeah uh, dr mabel from cochin which conditions are included in the differential diagnosis of upper gi bleeding this also you have elaborately right. in the in initial slide i have given clearly esophagus okay. stomach and uh, that up to dj but uh, there is i mentioned other classification also ulcers trauma uh, etc whichever way you want to classify you can classify correct correct 
whatever is up to the ligament of treats. Treats, yes, correct. Dr. Ajay Shah from Mumbai, how is hemorrhagic shock assessed in patients with upper GI bleeding? I have, I have given a quick idea about uh, the simple test like a postural hypotension as well as supine position 40% loss and upright position 20% at weight. But if you want to have a calculation me method, there are methods, class 1, class 2, class 3 hemorrhage. That's how the other way of uh, classifying the hemorrhagic shock. So later, definitely you start the IV lines, transfusion I mentioned. If it improves to a initial resuscitation, that means a patient is got a mild uh, variety and he's not bleeding. But if the bleeding is continuing, then of course you need to further evaluate. Uh, Dr. G. V. Prakash from Tirupati, he, he is very appreciative of your talk. It's always a new learning from your talks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Om Prakash Somani uh, from Latour. Causes of hematemesis at the age of 90 years at interval of two months, patient is asymptomatic and healthy at this age. Scope is, is it contraindicated for mild hematemesis? How do you, how, what is your take on this? I think uh, 90 years patient to to uh, uh, two source of hematemesis and if this what is that you are suspecting first thing that's why history is important here if you rule out a carcinoma or something like that it might have been bleed from the angiodysplasia yes, elderly patient it has stopped i think let us not int uh, let us not intervene uh, my my take for him some imaging and see whether uh, yes yes non-invasive if you are able to you know do do don't uh, don't <laughs> True. Tricky, tricky question sometimes, situation. Uh, Dayanand Nuli from Chikkodi is uh, very appreciative of your talk. He Thank you, asking, um, What is the role for, is there any role for ice cold saline irrigation through rice tube initially? I have, I have, I have used it, not that, uh, you know, it is uh, so, but uh, the problem here is that uh, uh, today, if you are able to, this called a high volume saline wash has been given, high volume saline wash. Right, right. So that is uh, better rather than the, we have used uh, once upon a time ice cold milk drip also. Correct. Not that, uh, so, so I think. In those time we had not much of other. Other drugs including a high dose pantoprazole etc. Yeah. Et there is not much of role for yes. ice cold saline. Yes. Okay. Dr. Mandal from Calcutta, role of transfusion in the initial assessment of upper GI bleeding. This also. Yeah, so I have mentioned hold on, hold on uh, strategy. If a patient has got around 8.59, I think you should not give. You, you correct the coagulation profile, correct by giving the fresh frozen plasma and all that thing. So, but keep it ready. That is what should be the policy. So later, definitely use it. So if it is dropping further. Right, right. So these are some of the questions and uh, there are many, many more questions. I think uh, Dr. Aishwarya is already waiting to conclude. Thank you very much. Yeah. It was wonderful and very beneficial to both practicing surgeons and also for postgraduates. It was very, very enlightening. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajagopal Shanai. And thank you, thank you Zaidas, Dr. Aishwarya for having both of us here today. Uh, in this platform of educating and we also learning so many things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Shuram. Thank you, Aishwarya. Thank you, Zaidas, for giving this opportunity. Thank you so much, sir. I just received the count. So approximately we have 513 uh, doctors who are watching us right now and a lot of positive feedbacks received. So a big, big thank you on behalf of audience and on behalf of Zydus, it was a very good learning experience for all of us. We look forward again to learn from you again, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for participating.